And while there are many great people and organizations working fervently to help shift our course, and you've heard from many of them in the last few days, far too often our efforts happen in isolation. Though the social ecology of this movement of movements requires many distinct and particular niches, we also need to be able to work in concert to achieve the leverage we need to shift our whole society's course. And although collaboration has been a buzzword in the nonprofit world for several years, when the rubber meets the road, good collaborations often prove difficult to achieve. In the funding world, evolving beyond the silo approach that's typified philanthropy for so long, and applying systems thinking is just peeking over the horizon to become more widely implemented. We often say that shifting our course will require more than technical solutions and innovations. It'll require a shift in heart. I believe that a third element is needed, which we refer to as social technologies. These involve learning how to relate to each other better across all kinds of differences so that we can find common ground, work together through our issues, move beyond polarization, and together become far more effective. And that's why we've invited as our final speaker this weekend someone whose brilliant work offers us a remarkable model that illustrates perfectly the sorts of cross-sectoral coalitions we need to build. Rick Reed has a classic Bioneers resume. He has a background in molecular biology. He was a longtime organic farmer and farm advocacy activist in his younger days, and today he runs a consulting firm in Berkeley. He's been a highly sought after consultant to nonprofits and foundations, working on sustainability in agriculture, forest management, urban planning, and green business for over 20 years. In the course of Rick's varied career, he's had experience on both sides of the money equation, as a grant seeker and as a funder. As a senior advisor to the Garfield Foundation, Rick has helped to design and lead its extraordinary collaborative green clean energy project, REAMP. Seeking to design a project that could model a systems approach to multi-stakeholder collaboration, they chose REAMP for three reasons, including REAMP's ultimate applicability to other regions and issues and the project's potential impact. REAMP was de designed as a seven-state network to include Iowa, Illinois, Michigan, Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wisconsin. Rick's third motivation, as if the first two weren't audacious enough, was to organize a model constellation of funders and NGOs to show how funding could be done more systemically and so more effectively. Their goal is to make the U.S. Midwest a leader in 21st century clean energy by reducing its electricity sector global warming pollution some 80% by 2030. Oh. Wait, <laughs> it gets better. This ambitious project unites environmental groups, ratepayers, labor unions, rural economic development groups, and many others to work for sound policy solutions to stop global warming. The member groups of REAMP have realized together they can create impacts that are far greater than the sum of their parts. Connecting with their colleagues gives each member access to a wealth of information and intelligence about events, policies, legal cases, data, political alignments, and more that would otherwise be impossible to gather on their own. By working together, they can work smarter, faster, and far more effectively. If such efforts can succeed in the Midwest, a region with powerful historic connections to the coal and mining industries, they can certainly succeed in other places. If they can work with energy and power, the lessons here are applicable to many of the other large-scale changes we face. And while building networks for collaborative systemic change may require us to shed some behavioral conditioning and shift our stories of scarcity, competition, and control, the payoffs will be huge. Please join me in welcoming a man whose buoyancy, vision, and perseverance have proven it can be done, Rick Reed.
over there and start saying thank you. Okay, great. Wow, what a pleasure to be here with you today. Now, I'm going to start just sharing with you a little family drama this morning. I have a four-year-old, and he wanted to come to Bioneers to see Papa 30 feet tall. <laughs> but it turns out today is his best friend Teo's birthday. So all morning it was Bioneers, birthday. Bioneers, birthday. Well, anybody who knows a four-year-old knows where he is. So Otto, I hope you're going to watch this DVD. Your Papa loves you. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, you know, before, I, I'd like to dedicate this talk today to Otto, to all the future generations coming to Otto, but I'd also like to dedicate it to two other groups, um, activists and philanthropists. I'd like to see a show of hands just so I know in the audience, if you consider yourself an activist or a philanthropist, if you could raise your hand. Oh, fabulous. Almost everybody for those people in satellite land. Well, this talk today is for you. Uh, there are two plot lines to my story today. One is about how an incredible group of activists and philanthropists have come together in the heartland of this country, in the very middle of this country, to make it a hotbed of activism for climate protection. The other is that uh, that work the other plot line is how that work has been empowered and facilitated by challenging the old ways, the calcified old ways that competitive grant making and activism associated with that kind of competitive grant making is done. And thanks to challenging that, we've created a systems approach, highly collaborative, and I think you'll hear in my discussion today the benefits of trying to challenge that system and not accept business as usual. So, um, let me start. Whoops. Whoa. Uh -oh. Hmm. This might be the wrong set, but we'll go with this. Um, <laughs> all right. For the. Um, no, I think we'll go. Let's just run. Um, uh, uh, for the NGOs in the room, how many of you are happy with the way grant making works now? Uh, how many are unhappy? Raise your hand and make a sound. Mm. Yeah, the competition, the trying to make yourself better than the next guy even though you need to play together in the sandbox with them to get anything done. The different guidelines when you go to the different foundations and you have to nip and tuck yourself a little bit differently as you apply to each one. The reporting separately to each one. That's conventional competitive grant making as it exists. And I gotta tell you, as somebody who's on the other side of the desk, on the foundation side giving away the money, it's not that great either. You get proposals coming in the door. One of them sounds great until you read the next one, and it's sort of the same thing, but they don't mention the people that just wrote the previous one. And even if you find a set you like, the folks who are across town who are funding in the same issue area are funding a whole different set of things, maybe even in conflict with what you're funding. So it's just not only is it isolating and is it frustrating for both sides of the desk, but it's holding us back. We need to make more progress more rapidly now. And this old model is holding us back. So I'm gonna talk to you today about changing that old model and what we've done to do that. Um, how did this happen? Well, like a lot of good ideas, it came to me while I was laying in bed. I wasn't quite asleep, I wasn't quite awake, and I heard sort of this, I was kind of musing on grant making, and I heard this voice, and James Hillman, who spoke on this very stage, who wrote a wonderful book called The Soul's Code that I commend to you, he would say it was my soul talking to me. My soul said, there must be a better way. There must be a better way. Well, two weeks after that conversation with myself, I was in a car ride from an airport to a funders conference with Jenny Curtis, the executive director of the Garfield Foundation. And I just decided, really, you could give it up for Garfield. <laughs> I just decided I was gonna share with her my frustrations 
over the competitive grant making model. I'd been an activist, I'd been a um, grant maker. And to my delight, Jenny lit up like a Christmas tree. And that two hour car ride just zoomed by. And by the time it was finished, we decided we were gonna ask the Garfield board. We were gonna ask them to see if they would uh, get involved in changing grant making, be a pioneer. Well, two months later, we took this idea to the Garfield board. There must be a different way. And the Garfield Foundation, as well as myself, we had uh, both had experience with an organization called the Natural Step, some of you may be familiar with. And the Natural Step, when we were working with them, was working with very large companies, and they were looking at their ecological footprint. And they were applying systems thinking and systems tools to figure out ways to reduce that footprint. And Jenny and I thought, well, why not try to apply systems thinking and approaches to philanthropy and activism? So we asked the Garfield board if they would get behind that. And they, to my delight again, made a, a five-year commitment, two and a half million dollars over five years, $500,000 a year, not to a program category like stopping this or stopping that or in, uh, increasing this or that, but to a process. Let's try to invent a different kind of grant making based on systems thinking. Um, where did we do it? Well, we chose the Midwest. As Nina said, we thought if we could do something in the Midwest, people would never be able to say, oh, you did that in Marin, or you did that in California, <laughs> you know? Oh, sure. Or the Northeast, both of which, California, the Pacific Northwest, the Northeast, real hotbeds for climate work, for renewable energy. We thought if we could do it in the Midwest, it would mean more. More difficult, but it would mean more. And um, that area, by the way, a shout out right there to the pioneers at the satellite locations. There's Illinois, there's Iowa, and there's Minnesota. Woohoo! <laughs> Reampers. There's reampers in all those states, and in, in as well North Dakota, South Dakota, uh, Wisconsin, um, Wisconsin. <laughs> so that's where we based the project. We started with seven foundations. They all had skin in the game. They were already making grants to organizations advancing renewable energy in those states. But in typical fashion, they weren't talking to each other really. They weren't uh, looking at each other's guidelines. And so consequently, the NGOs in the area were experiencing all the difficulties that the folks in this audience know so well. Um, we picked, as well, two NGOs from each state that were already the grantees of these foundations. So a dozen NGOs, seven foundations, and this was the first thing we really did differently. We said we're gonna do it together. It wasn't two different sides of the street, but we were gonna actually do it together. Um, and examine the energy system that we were all trying to reform um, and try to come to a shared understanding of the forces that are animating that system uh, and those that when we go to reform it, when we step towards reforming it, push back against us, and those forces when we step in to reform it, actually put wind in our sails to understand what those are, a shared understanding is what we were looking for. And if you remember yesterday's talk, we would also, through systems thinking, come up with those key leverage points. That was the promise, those trim tabs that were talked about yesterday. So let me just talk for a minute, take a little bit of the mystery out of, whoops. Boy, this really, oh yeah, this is the, this, yeah, okay. Um, I'll take some of the mystery out of this, uh, systems mapping. What you do initially, well maybe I'll take it backwards. What you do initially, you have a systems person, you have gotta hire a consultant, this is an expert deal. You hire them and they individually would talk to all 19 of us who were involved in this project. And in talking to those 19 folks, they begin to build an idea of how the system that we're trying to reform this energy system works. And they also get a sense that they're, um, it clusters. And so then they have individual meetings with the folks who fit into each cluster. And the mapper, it's visual, they map out what's go, what they think they've heard from that set of interviews, and they test it. This is what I think you said about how your world works in this part of the system that you understand so well. And people push back against it and say, well, no, you don't have that right. And they keep at it until they get it right. And they do it with each of the different groups. 
And then in the end, all three groups come together, or however many the clusters are, and they put those maps up, and they integrate them across, so you get a sense of how the whole system works. And through that, you get a sense of what people's assumptions are, and what they think really are the driving forces in that system that have both favored work as they've stepped forward into reforming it and pushed back against it. So in our case, to give you then a, a sense of what it looks like, that's our system's map. I don't mean you to read, uh, for you to read that, but what's impressive about it is that on a single page, those are the forces that people with about collectively, these 19 people, have about 150 years of experience in that electric system in the upper Midwest. That's their idea about how it works. So the first thing you get is just a clear picture that everybody can agree on who's in the room. The second thing that you, you start to get out of this process, if it's successful, is a goal. We walked into this process thinking we were about renewable energy and advancing it. An indicator of the health of that process is that we ended up with a goal that was about greenhouse gas emissions and becoming leaders in climate stability. Because we realized as we looked at all of the elements across that system and their interrelationships, we could never scale up renewable energy to the level we needed if we didn't take on other elements in the system like coal. Now, in addition, to uh, providing us with a goal. And now we've got a North Star. Just think about that. Everybody can test their work and say, is it leading towards an 80% reduction or not? Proposals that come in the door, you have an acid test. Um, uh, for uh, NGOs, for activist groups, advocates, you've got a way to say, is this ambitious enough? Will it really take us there? Or is it too small of a step? The next insight we really had was that these are the four drivers in that system that we needed to concentrate on. Not all 106 elements, but these four, just four things. And the other insight, a strategic insight, is that those things are interrelated. This is the electric system. It's what keeps the lights on. You've got to be careful when you go to reform it that you don't do things that inadvertently cause things to go haywire. So for example, two examples. One, you see there, you've got to retire the existing fleet of dirty coal plants. In the Midwest, 70% of the electricity comes from them. Well, you can't just go after those if you hadn't first really ramped up clean energy generation and energy efficiency because the lights would go off or you'd put a lot of pressure and you'd give a lot of political support to the folks who are trying to build the dirty coal plants. So you'd inadvertently be working at cross purposes. The second idea of interconnection that I'll, I'll put out there is that while we were doing this process, a $100 million wind farm was announced. And that felt like real success. A lot of the advocates involved in this thing were a part of that. And they were like, look at this, $100 million. You guys, you foundations invested, you know, half a million to help us do this. That's effective philanthropy. In that same period of time, a utility in that same town announced a $1 billion coal plant. Yeah. So if your goal is an 80% reduction and you're taking a look at the whole system, you realize you're going backwards, not forwards. So this um, systems look did something almost immediate. You know, we had foundations and NGOs together participating in this. Within two months of this analysis being completed, $2 million in philanthropic dollars moved across the table to begin opposing these new coal plants. About 30 of them were proposed for the region. And since we made this decision, which is to leave no coal plant unopposed, since we made that decision, <laughs> one has, been, has broken ground, 15 have been stopped outright. They're off the books. <laughs> yeah. All the rest are tied up in political, financial, legal knots that we don't think they'll be able to unknot. So, but that's, that's a, another story. But there was a, a, something that happened as a result of that that in hindsight was really important, which is up until now, these folks had been just, these are activists, you're activists. We're going to meetings and meetings and analysis and thinking and reflection. You're not doing. And people were getting concerned that, wait a minute, is this just an academic exercise? But when $2 million moved across the table, it gave people a sense that this was real 
and important, and it motivated them to keep participating in what we were doing. So we had this insight. These four things are interconnected. From there, what we did, and what anybody would do, I'm sure you would do, is we formed four teams to look at those things in depth. What do you really need to do in, in terms of the coal storing, in terms of energy efficiency and, and clean energy in order to get to this 80% reduction in global warming pollution that we agreed was our, our mutual goal? And at the same time those four teams began to meet, um, we grew from a dozen NGOs to about 30 that were participating in that thinking process and that strategy process. And we also began to build a network that I'll talk to you about. This idea of uh, think systemically, act collaboratively became our motto. Think systemically, act collaboratively. And we began to put a network in place to enable that. I'll talk about that later. Um, whoops, see, that's, this is the wrong deck. 25-year um, goals is what came out of that process originally, this deep dive from the four teams. I won't speak to them, but if you could look at them, I don't know if you can read them carefully or not. But what I'll say about this is that you had 25-year goals, and if you add those together, no one group, energy efficiency couldn't do it, clean couldn't do it, the coal folks couldn't do it on their own, they couldn't get to 80% reduction in the pollution from the region and keep the lights on, but together they could. So each of them took a piece and made a very specific goal. And engineers actually vetted these goals and determined, indeed, you could meet your 80% your reduction goal and have a stable electric system if you, if you met those uh, targets. So that was, you know, gave people a sense of we do it all together and this is how it looks. From that point, the groups then did backcasting. Each working group did backcasting. And uh, what I mean by that is they said, okay, that's, that's where we want to get in 25 years. Where do we need to get in the next three years, the next one year? And they made specific goals and um, objectives for the next one year and three years and strategies to get there. And this is uh, something that I'm just so incredibly proud of. That now becomes the, the menu, the set of guidelines that the foundations look at to determine, is this a good project to fund or not? And so instead of having foundations on their own writing these guidelines and people applying, we've got a community of folks, foundations and NGOs together, figuring out what the best strategies are. The, the, um, you know, there is a cost to that, to, the, to, the, to, to the everyone, which is we have to continually review together and learn together to see are they working or not and make mid-course corrections as needed to change them, but we're doing that collaboratively. Um, Oops, yep, yeah. this is... Um, let me just talk about, a little bit about a, how a collaborative, systemic approach actually works in terms of from the activist perspective. What you've got, you know, our systems map not only told us the four drivers, but it told us some levers underneath them, some important places to push. And so the REAMP members are spread throughout the system pushing on those. And they're not, you know, you don't have their hands on the levers of power, but they can act as catalysts by pushing on them. Now the system is really big. And so if it was just any, if you were pushing on just any one area, it's easy for the system to push back against what you're trying to do. But by pushing on them simultaneously, you have a much greater chance of having the system evolve in the direction you're trying to get it to evolve into. So you know, I just don't have time today to tell you about all the fabulous successes that have happened as a result of taking this collaborative systemic approach in the real world. You know, the fact that Minnesota uh, passed a law that says 30% of all the electricity generated in their state has to come from renewable sources. That they, by 2009, there's a moratorium on coal plants in Minnesota. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, you know, and state after state, likewise. Um, and, and in addition, you know, th we've aligned the funding that's happening in the region around what these working groups are figuring out and so forth. But in addition, four million new dollars has flown, uh, flowed into the region in, in the last, um, you know, a little over a year. So as you know, activists, you know how that is, there's never enough money to go around. This kind of an approach is attracting from national funders of those kind of resources. So I don't have time to tell all of, of the successes, but what I will do is give you a proxy. 
um, in 2007, the governors of the, uh, all the REAMP states committed to what is essentially REAMP's platform. They signed an energy security and climate protection accord on a stage much like this. All the governors from the REAMP region, and it's expanded now from the original six to include Michigan and Ohio, signed on and, and got up in front of everyone uh, to state they're taking their states towards a clean energy future. That was in four years. We started in 2004. So I'm really... So yeah, you know, a lot of things, obviously, you know, Al Gore's movie and, and a, a range of other things. Arnold Schwarzenegger here in California making it safe for Republicans to, you know, global warming to move that forward. Um, but the, the, yeah, I really, not bad. But I would say a, a lot of progress in a really short amount of time. And I can't resist just showing you, um, let's see here. These are all the groups that have been involved in this. and. Thanks to Google Maps, that's just a map of, of, of some of the projects that we're doing. So I don't have time to tell you all the nuts and bolts about what we did, but I'm going to tell you, leave you with three things that I hope um, will inspire you. So one, for the philanthropists in the crowd, Garfield is still an anomaly. Very few foundations support process. They mostly fund programs. And I think in our, you know, the field of systems thinking and collaborative um, processes, there's a whole bunch of proven tools that we've applied that you could take whatever project you're working on, someone needs to be a checkbook. In our case, Garfield was. And I would just urge you to think about, you know, Garfield, we invested probably a million dollars in getting to the point where we had the map where we got the goal, where we understood the leverage points, where we put the um, uh, working groups in place to really take a deep dive. You know, a million dollars. If we would have spent that million bucks on program work, I don't think we would have those governors signing those platform um, that they signed. So that's for the philanthropists in the crowd. Secondly, systemic collaboration really requires infrastructure. And so when I say that the working groups get together and they refresh their goals and so forth, those working groups, we want them to do that. We want them to meet. We want them to share information. They do on a monthly basis, and they quarterly get together in person. Uh, those folks get $70,000 each in support just to be able to do that. We don't just say collaborate. We give them some real tools to do it and some funding to do it. Yeah, that's right. Um, we also have put these other things in place. Uh, I'm going to talk about the ones on the bottom. I'll get to the ones on the top in just a second. Oh boy, there we go. Whoops. Back. Um, if you were an organization, a business, and you had eight states where your territory and you had 70 offices, you would have the best online web-based communication infrastructure you could afford. Well, NGOs don't deserve anything less. So we put an online infrastructure in place to enable that kind of collaboration, sharing information. It's incredibly active online community. It's password protected. Likewise, as an a activist groups all need media services. They all use them. And so instead of you know, everybody doing that, we set up a media center that does focus groups and helps figure out how to frame the issues we're talking about and shares that information throughout the whole network. And likewise, they keep a database of all the reporters who are covering the beat. And so no one has to wonder, oh, I'm, uh, who's covering the um, clean energy in Iowa? With a phone call, they can figure it out. Um, lastly, and this is a key piece, that learning in progress, a key innovation. If you're taking a systems approach, it, I, I talked about our systems mapping and our strategies. And you could see them up there, and you can look at them. They're just best guesses. The world is a really complex place. And so everybody in REAMP has committed to learning together over time. Everybody who gets a project funded has to send in information about that project to a central place through our web system. We have an analyst who looks at that, who aggregates that information across the entire network. You're, they're looking at now 70, 80, 90 projects. And they're able to extract from that best practices that might be migrated. They're able to uh, figure out what, um, 
um, are gaps? What are opportunities that we might um, uh, take advantage of? Good things that we want to amplify. So it's a critically important piece. Lastly, this idea, sharing power is powerful. In REAMP, foundations do not call the shots. We have an elected steering committee, and that steering committee is made up of the five working group leaders plus foundations. And we make decisions together, strategic decisions. Our, our um, mission is to support the work of the working groups and to look out over the horizon about what the network would need to succeed in this really audacious goal that we have. And so the steering committee, um, for example, we figured, we figured out together, environmental groups can't make this lift. It's too big, this 80% reduction. We need new constituencies. And so we figured, uh, we, we then determined we needed faith groups and youth groups to join us. And thanks to the Candida Fund, we pulled together three quarters of a million dollars uh, to do that. And so now faith groups and youth groups are joining with environmental groups to do this work and are aligned on this action. Yeah. Uh, and lastly, we don't just make decisions together, we share the power of the purse. We've put together a fund, Garfield started it with about three quarters of a million dollar investment last July, last July. It now has four million dollars in it. The RFPs for those funds, um, the guidelines for them, the actual review of the proposals, the decisions are done by the five working group leaders and three foundations. And so we're really sharing this idea of uh, sharing power. And when, when, when we started this, there was a lot of skepticism. Other foundations who are part of sort of the old way of doing things says, you can't do it. You'll get nonprofit malpractice. They'll be self-dealing. There'll be folks who um, will just reward their friends. But I have found that this is some of the smartest, most strategic grant making I've ever seen. These are the folks who wear the shoe, they know where it pinches. They understand who's who and what's what. And it's a fantastically fun way to do business as well. It's really collaborative and fun. Um, and let me just close then by saying that we're continuing, REAMP is continuing to connect and evolve. The network that we've built is based on system principles as well. Those different uh, shared assets that we put together, those are put down low, as low on the food chain as we can, based in different organizations. And so th they're uh, distributing our resources. The network itself has been robust enough to accommodate a new transportation working group that's been added. These um, new constituencies, faith and youth groups. And we continue to be committed to this idea of thinking strategically and acting uh, systemically. It's a lot of work. It changes the way you normally do business. I, won't, I, I don't want to short sell that, it really does. Um, but it gets us fa there faster. It's given us, uh, enabling us to get, do progress, make more progress faster than we otherwise would. And so with all that work that's involved in it, I would just leave you um, with this idea. And that's it, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.